Thank you for joining our webinar on the Law Firm Design Revolution Generational Influence. It's important to note that we'll be holding all questions until the end of the presentation. You can ask a question by utilizing the questions box on your screen or emailing info at interiorarchitects.com. If you're interested in hearing about future IA webinars, we invite you to follow IA Interior Architects on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at IA Architects. We'd like to begin by introducing our co-presenters. Joseph Geierman is Troutman Sanders' Director of Real Estate and Facilities. He is an IFMA Certified Facility Manager and a Cornet Master of Corporate Real Estate. Buzz Riley is the Managing Director of IA Interior Architects New York office. In his more than 30 years in the profession, he has directed a broad range of workplace projects for a variety of client types, including a uh, global legal financial technology and professional service companies. With over 2 million square feet of law firms completed, he has seen firsthand the evolution of legal workplace designs as well as generational impact. He worked closely with Joseph on Troutman Sanders' new Atlanta headquarters where, together, they pushed the boundaries of what's expected from legal office design. And without further ado, here's Buzz Riley. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for that very generous introduction. I'm in Atlanta today with Joseph Garriman in Troutman Sanders' offices. Welcome, Joseph. Same here. Uh, one of the things I also want to mention to the group, uh, on behalf of IFMA, first of all, thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, but I also want to mention that Joseph is a past president of the IFMA Atlanta chapter, as well as the IFMA Legal Industry Council. So very excited to have you with us and to have your expertise and insights. So today we're going to share with you our thoughts and perspectives on generational influence on the evolution and possible revolution of law firm design. We've prepared an agenda and we'll begin with an overview of the generational group through the groups through the past several decades and their collective influence on law firm design. And we'll hear from Joseph on his most recent experience in creating a 21st century law office for his firm. Yes, and, and by the way, I was muted earlier. Sorry about that, everyone. It's uh, Friday the 13th and technical difficulties, <laughs> but I am very, very happy uh, that the IFMA Legal Industry Council is able to uh, put together this webinar with IA, and we're excited about the topic. So you, you got to love technology these days, <laughs> right? That's all part of the 21st century law office design. Exactly. Uh, so going back to the agenda, uh, we'll conclude with exploring future possibilities with the next generation of lawyers yet to be seen from our famous uh, or infamous yet uh, Generation Z. So when we look back over the past century, we see the various periods of generations that were shaped by the context in which they emerged. And Joseph, I'm sure this is not anything you haven't seen before. No, many times, although uh, Generation Z is the, uh, the one that is a little bit new to me. So we're, we're gonna go all the way back to the traditionalists. Um, most have now retired, uh, I would say 99.9%, uh, .9 and baby boomers are beginning to make their way out of the workforce. So we really are in the Gen X millennial and, and Gen Z world at this point. Well, I, I will say that there's probably some firms where retired partners who are traditionalists are still <laughs> <laughs> hobbling into the office. <laughs> So one of the things that we is, is, that we looked at is that the um, the looking at each of these groups, the traditionalists were defined um, as within a period of history where there was great prosperity, and also the worst economic uh, conditions in America, the Great Depression. They were also the people who saw World War One and World War Two, global conflict on a scale that had not been seen before. The baby boomers were in an, a, a period of incredible prosperity in post-World War II, and they're best represented by consumption and expression of ideology. Uh, the Gen Xers followed, and they lived in a world of transition, of revolution and uncertainty. The Gen Xers consume status, while the millennials consume experiences. The millennials are here with us now, and they, they are becoming a high uh, percentage of the overall workforce. They live to work, or they work to live rather than live to work. 
They're the first global centric generation empowered by new technologies. And so Joseph, that brings us to Gen Z and they're our first digital natives. They're a group of people who only know global connectivity. Likely they've never seen a payphone or <laughs> even know what a landline is. They'll never know the anticipation of waiting for the Sears and Roebuck Christmas catalog. They're also a generation like the traditionalists that lived through one of the most traumatic economic periods in our country, the Great Recession. And they saw their parents lose jobs, they saw families lose their homes, and they, they, their future became rather gray at some point. Uh, and so it's interesting to see how the cycle has come full circle and the Gen Z, even though they live in a, a very technologically oriented world, their characteristics are still very much like the traditionalists. Well, they're looking for stability, right? Absolutely, they they um, they they crave that uh, that that groundedness um, that they didn't experience in their their early years. So when we look at how this is reflect how the cultures are reflected in law office design, we're we're just going to bypass the traditionalists. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that there's much left from that period of time to uh, to consider. But you know, Joseph, uh, one of the things we we we. These are um, images of law firms that were uh, during the Gen X period, but clearly influenced by the generation that preceded them. And, and these these are build outs, uh, probably primarily from the 1990s, right? Yes, yes. And yeah, you know, I, I started my career in the 90s and um, was generally pretty happy to come into any any uh, workspace, I guess, just based on based on the fact that uh, that was what was presented as, as kind of the norm. You didn't I think, question it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't think there was as much emphasis when I was uh, coming into the workforce on trying to bring me, you know, trying to cater to me so much as a, as a Gen Xer. I think that's changed a lot as there's more of a competition for talent. So today, for those young people who are just coming out of school, especially in certain uh, fields, probably there is a lot more, uh, a lot more of people in my position catering to them in terms of uh, trying to trying to to build workspaces they want to be in absolutely and and we'll we'll touch on that shortly recruitment and retention is absolutely one of the top priorities for any organization but particularly for law firms these days and and not only that but you're planning for the future you want to represent what the future is today and so in these images you can see there's strong historical references it does provide a groundedness a stability um, it tells the world that we're here and we're here to stay. Um, so that messaging clearly has, has transitioned over the years. If we, when we look at the planning of law firms during that time, we were still carrying over from uh, years past where it was still very traditional, planned with larger partner offices, smaller associate offices, secretarial to attorney ratios, sometimes one to one, you were quite progressive if you got one to two and a half. Um, it was also a very paper intensive generation, required tremendous filing capacity, sometimes up to 15 to 20 file drawers per attorney. Admin support and case rooms took a large part of the floor area and conference was relegated for the most part to conference centers. Uh, the collaboration space uh, was within closed walls. Well, I'll, I'll say that there's probably a, a fair number of people who on the phone who probably have some spaces that are like this. And I know at Troutman, we have some spaces that are set up like this. I think the the big challenge that um, that came was, you know, prior to the Great Recession, uh, if you needed more space for partners or, you know, you had more partners and you had partner offices, more associates than you had associate offices, you would just take on adjacent space. And you might even take on space to prepare for this, you know, influx of additional uh, partners, but it wasn't it wasn't very flexible. And then after the Great Recession, a lot of us ended up with a lot of excess real estate we were trying to to deal with that was not really the most efficient. So and, and it it also lacked flexibility really uh, from a real estate and construction perspective. The um you you were certainly cutting edge uh, when you were planning two partner offices equal to three associate offices so you could make changes in the future if you mm -hmm. wanted to. So as time passed and the millennials began to move into the workforce, we do begin to see a shift occur. Um, Multi-use spaces began to appear. Transparency became the marching orders of the day, especially after Dodd-Frank. 
that introduced a whole new way of doing business and and people wanted to make sure that their clients understood that they were following the rules and uh, so you do start to see uh, more glass appear uh, from attorney offices to conference rooms uh, as these uh, plans and designs developed, uh, we started to see more collaborative and shared amenity spaces on the perimeter windows. These were no longer sacred to just partners within a, a law firm. Uh, streamlined operations were reflected through streamlined design, and that was the message that, the, that firms wanted to send. Elaborate custom admin stations were exchanged for more cost-effective furniture solutions. Collaboration and team-oriented spaces reflected millennials' desire to work in groups. And and to to tie it back, like from what the previous generation is experiencing too, I think you know when we had talked about this earlier, we said this is from the mid two uh, thousands on is when this really got started. So mm -hmm. a lot of this uh, design trend is post recession and you know probably geared towards a much more efficient use of space. Absolutely. Well, speaking of efficiency, so one of the uh, one of the things that we uh, are seeing a lot more of, and Joseph, your firm is a great uh, great leader in this area, is universal office planning for attorneys. Uh, instead of having that two size office, uh, the the approach of using universal office sizes, and which they're ranging at about 150 square feet on average. Uh, are increasing uh, the, the efficiency of the floor plate. It's saving in real estate costs. It helps to address practice groups uh, growth and, and uh, retraction uh, over time. Um, and we're seeing a lot less space dedicated to admin support. And I, I, it's interesting how the word secretary has become quite an antiquated these days, uh, specifically for law firms. And legal professionals uh, are is the the word of the day um, because their secretaries, paralegals, all combined and went and potential future attorneys, um, and we're seeing fewer of that required as you have generations coming in who are more technologically savvy, lawyers who are more independent and don't need that uh, direct admin direct support. Technologies also allowed uh, the file storage to be reduced significantly. Um, it's freeing up space for more spaces such as collaboration, amenity, social spaces. So, so just uh, really quick, like looking at this uh, floor footprint, it's very similar to the one that you just uh, showed the bigger, the partner and associate size offices. So it's much more efficient. It is. Uh, in fact, we picked up seven attorney offices between those two floors. And Joseph, this is a prototypical floor. Um, it's actually uh, an ideal floor plate uh, for a law firm uh, as part of a study that we've done. And I'm going to stretch the rubber band just a little bit more. Uh, we've also looked at other opportunities to increase uh, efficiency of floor plates, reducing the universal office to uh, 105 square feet. And, you know, it's uh, you still are able to get conferencing within the rooms, but you're able to free up more of the floor space to address collaborative and conferencing needs, uh, so any other additional support needs that you may need on the floor. So one of the most significant things that we have seen in the evolution over the generations is it, it we truly are seeing a, a huge reduction in the square foot per attorney, almost by 50%. We're seeing dramatic increases in the ratios of attorneys to secretaries. Um, it, we, we've, we've heard uh, five to one, and that is becoming a little bit more standard. People are pushing six to one, seven to one, depending on their, their practice and their, their culture. Uh, office sizes are continuing to range um, for attorneys from 125 to 225 square feet. But the ideal floor plate size, does address it actually addresses all of the different uh, approaches that you may have, and we see that as somewhere between 23 and 28,000 rentable square feet, 22,000 usable, depending on your market and how rentable is calculated. Uh, things to look for would be the the perimeter to core depth. We see 35 feet as being ideal, and perimeter window modules to help you to create a standardized office as you go around. Yeah, I think the windows are the biggest challenge when we're trying to plan space a lot of the time. Absolutely. And, you know, law firms are still one of the greatest users of space in the industry when you start to compare to other organizations. 
So wrapping up, some of the trends that we are seeing currently uh, in the market are, as we talked about, the universal reduced office sizes, increased collaboration, shifts to resource centers in lieu of uh, separate uh, areas for admin workstations and, and support, emphasis on visual transparency, changing support ratios, Hospitality, that is one of the, the big trends right now, is introducing a hospitality factor to the, the design of offices. Uh, operations densification and health and wellness is becoming more and more predominant. Mm -hmm. So Joseph, I'm gonna let you talk a little bit about your experience in the workplace transformation that you've experienced here uh, in Atlanta. Okay. All right, well, uh, so uh, thank you, Buzz. I appreciate that. Again, I'm Joseph Geierman, uh, Director of Real Estate at Troutman. And uh, in 2017, we kicked off a project to build out uh, 230,000 square feet of space in our, uh, in our, the building that we're in in Atlanta. We actually moved from an upper, upper set of floors in the stack to the middle of the stack and we're able to build out new. Um, it was a great project. Uh, we brought IA in fairly early in the process and uh, we had a few project goals. Um, one was not to take on more space than we actually need. So in previous, uh, in our past history, we had taken on a lot of space in the building and actually had excess real estate <laughs> all the way up until uh, 2016 uh that we really didn't need so we actually ended up giving back a hundred thousand square feet to the building we didn't want to be in a position where we were uh kind of stuck with a bunch of offices no one was using again so very important for us to just make sure that we're actually taking on the space we need that we're using space efficiently and building in multiple uses wherever possible and that includes standardizing wherever possible and that includes office sizes we standardized on furniture, standardized on amenities that we used, really trying to make um, the experience as plug and play as possible and make the operation of the space as easy as possible. Um, you know, but in addition to that, we wanted a space that people wanted to work in. We are competing for talent. And, um, you know, unlike when I was coming into the workforce, we do have to compete for young people and try to get them to stay here. Um, and part of that is making a positive statement about the firm's culture. That's not just for the people that are lateral hires, uh, new associates and staff, but also for our clients. Um, and we needed to make sure this was a workplace that would, as you'll see through the pictures, there was a lot of money that went into this build out. We've got a lot, 10 years that we have to capitalize it over, more than 10 years. So we needed to create a workplace we could thrive in for the next decade. Uh, an important part of, uh, of the project, I just wanted to touch on this, was change management. Uh, in the process, uh, I was working with the, um, with the HR team and really got them involved to, to start engaging employees on, um, on understanding what this change was going to be like. Uh, early on, uh, we we engaged IA to do a video rendering of the space. Mm -hmm. So it showed various uh, various areas where, you know, you kind of walked through and you saw for what, what ended up being a pretty close uh, version of what we ended up with. Yep, and I, I would say that's one of the marks of Troutman's success with their new offices was their communications during the design process. Uh, we not only had uh, town halls where uh, the, the entire firm was invited and we shared with them uh, as a team what was happening and why it was happening. And so they had, they were definitely a part of the involvement of the transformation. And I'll say we, we tried to, we tried to be very clear about our messaging also um, at the town halls that Buzz mentions. Um, while we tried to emphasize the positives, which were uh, everyone getting adjustable height furniture, the fact that we had better amenities like uh, cook freestyle machines, better coffee, uh, the fact that the furniture in general was better and it was a nicer looking space and everyone was going to have access to daylight, uh, there were a significant number of people who were going to move out of interior offices into um, into uh, workstations and we, we were honest about that. 
and addressed it in the um, in the uh, town hall meetings and other venues. Um, but we also we also got people engaged by uh, doing chair fairs, doing other uh, fairs where they got to taste the new coffee, and just trying to make people feel like they were a part of the process. And I think we were very successful at that. At the end of the uh, end of the project, a few months later, I was uh, told by an attorney uh, who who really uh, was not thrilled about moving that he didn't hate the space as much as he thought. So that was actually uh, pretty pretty high praise from him. I think that's one of my favorite stories <laughs> about the project. Um, so uh, really quickly, this is just, uh, you can see the, the typical plan. It's a little hard to tell, but there's all kinds of different sized offices here. And then you've got a maze of, uh, of interior space with actually a lot of filing around the inside perimeter. Um, in the new space, most of the offices are about the same size. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things I think I did a very good job with was uh, was figuring out a way to, uh, even with the strange uh, layout of our building, um, to generally create pretty good uh, single size offices. Um, you know, there's still a little bit of a hierarchy in terms of some of the corner uh, spaces, but even so, it's still a much easier place for us to do um, space planning than it was before, and we're able to fit a lot more people into the floor plate. Actually, um, we gained so much efficiency that we were able to use the uh, the exterior on every uh, full attorney floor, as well as our staff floors, for uh, for an, a town center or, or kitchen break room as well so it was actually pretty uh uh it was actually a pretty uh pretty great use of space i think the other thing is uh our secretarial stations you can see one in the upper uh left hand corner one in the lower right hand corner and uh we didn't put them in all four corners because we didn't need that many secretaries um so we put collaborative stations uh on the other two and it was just a way to uh, a way to use the um, space differently. I don't know that the collaborative sta stations are used the way that we were hoping, and that's something we maybe would re rethink. I think the one other thing is that the uh, conference rooms that are on the perimeter, those could be turned into offices down the road if we needed to, so it's another growth strategy. So Joseph, this is a far cry from my prototypical plan we were looking at earlier. It, it certainly did have challenges, and and you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I think the the corners where you have partners or have attorneys, it, it was actually a great uh, transition for easing into the universal office planning, where there was that one little extra something on the floor. And I, I think any firm is going to face this as they are looking for real estate. Uh, the world is not full of rectangular buildings of 22,000 usable square feet. Not at all. So this is a really quick view. Um, you can see our old reception area, um, which was very traditional, a lot of marble, uh, you know, very fine details. Uh, you would walk in, you could see through this conference room on the right, uh, see out, but most of it was was about like the, the furnishings inside. Um, in our new space, uh, it's actually a very bright, very light, uh, you can see the, the glass conference rooms along the, the perimeter. And actually on that, in that opening lobby where people walk in, we did not, we did not put uh, Mecco shades. We actually built it so that they would always be open. And we did build in the opportunity to put a Mecco shades down the road if we needed to, but people have just adjusted to it and gotten used to it. We do have places elsewhere on the floor and in the building where, um, people can have more private meetings. And uh, you can't see it here, but they're actually across the way from the reception desk. Um, we have a room where, uh, you know, it's a multi-purpose room. Yeah, it's a multi-purpose room. A glass wall actually opens, so it will open up into the reception area. And there's a sky fold inside of it, so it actually can divide into two rooms. So there's just a lot of flexibility built into that. We can use it for after hours events. Uh, we can use it for meetings. We can use it for great big meetings. Um, it's a great uh, a great space that we can use for a lot of different things.
And and I think that's the key right there, Joseph, because before you, lovely space, you, you you guys had an amazing, amazing uh, office here. But what we've done now is go, gone from a space that was exclusively functioned to a very multifunction space. And and I've had the opportunity to join you here for a major event uh, right after mm -hmm. the, the office is open. And we saw how flexible the spaces were in being able to accommodate large groups, but you can also have the smaller groups in here as well. Uh, so this just shows a contrast between a former office, a corner office that belonged to a partner and then you know, what is essentially a partner's office today. And you can see that, um, you know, obviously the partner had a lot of old furniture. Um, the firm actually owned this. It wasn't, for the most part, the partners, although um, this particular person had a lot of furniture in their office. But we really, the, the great thing about having standardized furniture is that it's really plug and play. So if someone needs to move because their practice group is moving or they're moving to a different, floor for some reason, they can just get their stuff and move it up without having to worry about, oh, well, I need this chair and I need this uh, little side table and all this other uh, furniture they're moving around. And I think this furniture that we have now is much more functional. Uh, there's an adjustable height work surface on the work wall. Um, we've done that in all of our offices for the last few years because uh, when we made the, uh, the return, the adjustable height surface, people didn't like their computer screens being in the way when people would come in and sit with them. And and certainly a nod to health and wellness and getting people to, to get out of their chair and stand up. Yeah, and a lot of people use it too. Uh, and this just shows what our secretarial stations used to be like. And as the secretarial ratio has shifted, um, you know, fewer and fewer of the stations on the left have been occupied. So you might have one person on this entire row. Um, We've consolidated to those two uh, workstations per floor. And you can see there's three, uh, three secretaries, or um, we call them legal practice assistants now, who sit around there. They all have adjustable height work surfaces. And while they're looking into the glass offices of the attorneys, you can also see outside beyond that. And so they have access to daylight, whereas before it was a very dark space. And I think this is a great example too, Joseph, of how design has transitioned um, through the decades. Whereas back in the early 90s, there were still custom millwork workstations for secretaries being built. Whereas now furniture solutions are truly the, it, it, I don't know that anybody would build a custom <laughs> mill workstation anymore. And, and uh, you know, really quickly, we have an administrative floor as well and a couple of administrative floors. And we did in the past too. And uh, while there were a lot of people in workstations, the workstations were very tall. They were bigger than they needed to be. Um, the space still seemed kind of dark because the uh, view was blocked by the workstation. So you can see on the right how our workstations are laid out today. And uh, the wall height is no taller than 48 inches. Um, there are most of the people are in workstations. There are uh, directors and chiefs who still have offices on the interior. And uh, also on the interior are rooms that can be used as breakout rooms for impromptu meetings, as well as a few rooms with technology for uh, sharing screens. Um, it's, it's just a, it really is a much more pleasant space. And again, everyone has height adjustable furniture and um, there's, there's actually quite a bit of space for collaboration too. And it gets used fairly frequently because people here don't have private offices to go to as much. And, and even though you move down in the building, your views are still expansive. And I think being able to open up, uh, especially in a building with punched windows versus a curtain wall, it still feels amazingly light and, and airy. So, and again, uh, this is just our, uh, our old lounge break room on the, the left. It was a place that people will go to specifically to get, uh, you know, get something or to eat lunch. And a lot of people never used it because it was so dark and depressing. Our new ones are all on the window wall. Um, a lot of people go there just because it's a nice place to be. People go through it to their workspace. They go um, to get coffee. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of kind of unplanned interactions, and uh, it's a space that actually works well. It works very well for collaboration, actually. 
It, and it truly is a space that you want to be in. And then, Joseph, as you said, this is, even though it's a destination per se, it's not an exclusive destination like your previous space and one that was tucked away into the interior, into the bowels of the, the offices. And the fact that the, the lounge now is located right adjacent to the elevator lobby, you have to walk through there to get to your office you see people that you might not otherwise have interacted with during the day. And, and I think that's a, adds strength to your culture. So Joseph, this is, it truly has been a great experience working with Troutman and going through the transformation with you. And, and we've, we, we've enjoyed being a part of that. And you and I have had some very interesting discussions about what the next generation might look like, uh, what the next generation of law firms might look like. Um, you know, we're we're, uh, we're seeing uh, business changes starting to drive a shift in law office design. Uh, we're seeing a cultural shift from traditional partnerships to uh, what we've now tagged a FinLaw business model. Uh, in a recent Wall Street Journal article, the traditional partnership was noted as fading and likely more likely dying uh, or dead at this point. And law firms were starting to become more like a fan, financial institution or investment bank. Full-time chief, chief executives, some without law degrees, have replaced the senior partner running human resources, accounting, and real estate. Um, law firms are now often partnerships in name only. Well, and I think that a lot of that, it too, is as we see um, more big firms chasing the 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 rainmakers and offering them bigger and bigger bonuses, what it takes to be a, what it means to be a partner is sort of shifting to your, to your point. And really, um, you know, it's not just uh, necessarily a financial stake in the, the organization like it used to be. And um, I think that that is uh, driving more of a, a bottom line uh, type of approach that maybe wasn't there all the time in the past. Mm -hmm. And and it's simply a part of the evolution um, of uh, of any industry. Um, and so we're also seeing the general generational transitions um, starting to to drive a shift in law office design. You know, one of the things that we know is happening uh, is that there has been a decrease in law school enrollment since 2010, 25 percent actually. And the tech companies out there, the Googles, the Facebook, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn's. They are growing, growing, and they're bringing in uh, into their their fold uh, their own in-house in legal, and they are become, they're very attractive, particularly to the millennials and and soon to be uh, Gen Z, because that's where their peers are, and and these are uh, fun places, or they're they're represented as fun places with free bagels and and dry cleaning pickup and masseurs walking around the office. So there, there is, a, and I'm not suggesting, Joseph, in any way that law firms would be doing that, but it is certainly something that um, has to be taken into consideration. Well, and I'll, I'll say um, that I know our firm has started to, to uh, compete with some of those types of amenities, especially in markets where that's the norm, like the Bay Area. Um, they have an expectation that you're going to be providing these free uh snacks and different different things um you know which is is different than i think what the expectation of uh, of our law firm was you know even even 10 years ago and uh you know i think this other graphic down here about the average age of lawyers this actually you know 40 percent are still baby boomer, boomers but the average age is is square in generation x right now yep but the the millennials and uh are fast increasing and uh, it looks like Gen Z is actually even getting started in there. So some of the things that we know about Gen Z uh, or that have been observed um, are uh, they're, they're a group that needs supportive leadership and, and they're looking for positive relationships. You know, interestingly, the, this is, these are our digital natives, but yet they want that face-to-face -face interaction with their managers. Uh, some want uh, their interactions daily or several times a day, and 84% face-to-face communications. Even I'm finding that a little hard to believe. Um, yeah. Maybe because their parents uh, neglected them too much looking at their cell phones. <laughs> 
you know, they're much more pragmatic, they're much more money conscious, and uh, they're much more entrepreneurial. Um, again, living, having lived through the Great Recession, they they see the realities of what happens when the world is, is not delivering everything that they thought it was going to, and so they they're looking for that that stability. Um, they're a lot like baby boomers in that they're desiring to be more siloed and to work individually. Um, I think one of the the catchphrases these days is work alone together. Um, and uh, but interestingly enough, they still prefer a millennial manager over a Gen X or a baby boomer. Oh, probably because the uh, old old person is a little scarier to them. I don't know. <laughs> so what do we think the next gen lawyer is, is going to be about? Um, you know, we we you and I have been talking. This is somebody who is probably going to be highly mobile, but they're still going to need that home base. They want to share an office, but they also want to feel the energy of the organization that they're a part of. And here we go. They need to collaborate, but they also need to work alone together. So, you know, what I'm what I'm hearing when I when I uh, see you bring these points up and uh, and also show these images is that you know, they don't necessarily need, uh, they may still need an office, but they're not going to need their own assigned office. That will be right. some sort of free assignment um, thing, but we'll need to have more collaboration spaces and more, maybe more spaces where they can just work on their own and mm -hmm. still be out in the open. Mm -hmm. So w another characteristic, they're not pretentious and they do like a touch of whimsy in their work environment. I will say, uh, going back to that picture, like our uh, our dress code has shifted a little bit since I've uh, since I've been working at this law firm, but uh, we haven't gotten to the short stage yet. <laughs> so you know, interest, you, you started to touch on the the need for uh, collaborative spaces and and creating those work alone together um, zones. Let's let's take a look at what might possibly the the plan of the law firm look like or the future law firm look like. Uh, neighborhood planning. Um, you know, I, I I don't know how many people have their jaw dropped at this point to look at a plan and say why why are the attorney offices not on the window wall? You know, it it uh, it is a part of the evolution of design and and this is certainly stretching the rubber band, finding those uh, creating a space that really is geared towards the interaction of the people occupying the floor, creating these neighborhoods of built environment, uh, interior offices that are punched with open office areas for legal practice assistance, and still providing the formal and informal collaborative spaces, uh, whether they be for two people or 10 people throughout the floor. So Joseph, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think we'll ever get attorneys into open workstations? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm going to get attorneys into open workstations. <laughs> my uh, it is certainly something that we can consider uh, as as a potential for the future. Um, it would certainly give the greatest amount of flexibility uh, and and savings in construction costs. Uh, it would allow you to uh, truly move, uh, respond to uh, growth and retraction in different practice groups or even add uh, uh, practice groups. I think collaboration, though, is still going to be key and providing those spaces on the for and the social spaces as well. Um, the work alone together, the work alone, the work anywhere uh, mentality is still carrying through to from uh, millennials to Gen Z. And providing the spaces, the opportunities to decide where you want to work is going to be important. Um, and and you know the the thing that goes along with flexible planning is also looking at making these assigned and unassigned, and having hoteling as a concept applied to law firms. I will say that in our um, in our Atlanta office and in some of our other offices, our long term strategy for growth, if we need it, would be to implement some free assignment. Um, uh, strategies. Well, and, and certainly in urban areas, commuting is becoming more and more critical um, and, and, and longer. Um, interesting that uh, report came out recently where uh, there were several West Coast cities where people were spending uh, as much as um, four hours a day uh, commuting. And that's a tremendous amount of time just to go and sit somewhere. 
So what do we think that uh, this is gonna look like uh, in the space itself? Um, you know, I look at this image and think this could be today. Uh, you know, open collaborative areas, uh, different work zones, uh, different types of workspaces for individuals. Um, a lot of glass, a lot of transparency, a lot of openness and, and technology uh, interspersed throughout the, the floor. Again, same thing uh, where you have smaller work, individual workspaces, you have uh, it, it, almost every square inch would be used for, from wide, writable walls uh, to open collaboration areas and then providing uh, enclosed collaboration areas with furniture solutions even. I'd say this is not necessarily that different from uh, our administrative floors today. Uh, we don't use the furniture collaboration areas, but we do. Uh, it's not that different from, from some of the spaces that we have. And certainly those open collaboration spaces are going to be even more, uh, you're going to see more in the more of those in the future. Technology, I think, is going to have the greatest impact on the space design. It is, it has to be predominant uh, or prevalent um, throughout the, the spaces that you occupy. And as well as um, creating these spaces uh, next to perimeter glass so that you do have views, you do have light, and, and it really is a push on health and wellness. You know, one of the things about Gen Z as well is they have a very strong concern for the environment. They're growing up in a world where climate change is, uh, they hear it every day and we, we, we see it every day as well. And they're gonna wanna know that, um, that they're, they're a part of an organization that is taking care of the planet, that is sensitive to providing for the human uh, aspect uh, as well as the planet. So I don't know, Joseph. What do you think? Is this uh, is this our law firm of the future? Uh, <laughs> I, I'll I'll be surprised if I see this uh, this in a law firm anytime soon. So you know, this is one of the things we were talking about earlier, where you have the technology companies that are creating these these very very casual work environments, um, places where people can land uh, anywhere and work. Um, you know, this is this image is it shows no dedicated workspace, but there's lots of opportunities for people to find a place and to to do the work alone together. Um, I I'm I agree. I don't know that uh, aesthetically this is uh, necessarily where we're headed with law office design, but it is certainly something that needs to be considered, particularly as it relates to recruitment and retention that their peers are going to work in places like this and, and there, there needs to be a, a factor similar to this for law office design as well. Well, I will be interested to see it if you guys end up designing that. <laughs> so this is the end of our, our presentation. Um, Joseph, thank you for your, your input on this and thank you for sharing your story about the, the work on the Atlanta offices. We're, we're gonna open up to any Q&A uh, from anyone who's on the call. If anyone has anything. If you, oh, looks like we have our first comment. Uh, how would you deal with confidentiality issues that the legal work entails? And this is in the future scenario of open office layouts. Buzz, do you have do you have suggestions? So, it, you know that is one of the reasons for providing alternative spaces for uh, collaboration, for uh, getting behind a closed door um, to to be able to perform that way. Um, there are going to be some practice groups that perhaps sensitivity is is more of an issue. Um, than, than others, and um, you know the the, the greatest advantage, the greatest opportunity is to create those uh, zone, non assigned enclosed areas where attorneys can go and work for the day or reserve for the day, uh, and it is something that does continue to to come up, um, and and that's more from uh, a verbal confidentiality. Uh, certainly, technology has started to take away a lot of the paperwork that used to be a big concern where people wanted to have the locked files within their offices. I think, I think we're, we're moving away from paper being the biggest concern, although I think there's still a lot of attorneys who are very paper intensive. Um, I do know that in 
where we do have open workstations, uh, you know, having the places where people can go to get on the phone into a private office is, is pretty important. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons I'm, I'm most skeptical because of the way attorneys mm -hmm. work uh, about them being able to get totally away from private offices. They may be free assigned uh, private offices, but I still think that there's going to be some need for this fairly large uh, area taken up by places where people can go away for uh, meetings, but those might be much smaller right. um, than they are today. Right. And the one thing we won't see diminish is the, the conference rooms, uh, places where you do need that confidentiality with your clients. I'd like to thank Diego for that excellent question. Tom asks, what percentage of the total construction budget is dedicated to technology? He gives the example of cabling, AV, sound masking, et cetera. That's a great question, uh, and and it's certainly going to vary a bit um, depending on on the locale uh, as well as the. I the think it depends on the size of it. and the size of the. Because if you're building out a small space with a large, you know, a small space that's got a fairly large conferencing area, it's going to be a way higher percentage than uh, you know, like this this one. And and also the amount of technology that that one would put in, um, I I would say on average it's going to it could be anywhere from five percent to fifteen percent of your overall budget with fifteen percent bells and whistles. Yes, we uh, have have heard five to fifteen percent also as a, a benchmark. Um, Patty asks if we will receive a copy of this presentation, and uh, we will certainly be be sending a, a copy of the link to all participants. Um, and then uh, Christine asks uh, how we're handling privacy and confidentiality in these spaces. Would you say we, we addressed that question pretty well, gentlemen? Uh, I think so. I, I do think that, um, you know, we have all glass offices and uh, most of our conference rooms are glass now. Uh, we do have some where that are interior and, uh, but we've tried really hard not to put uh, any kind of frosting on on the windows that that are on the window wall you know the windows on the the exterior uh, offices or conference rooms because we just don't want that to become the norm um, but having having meco shades is important some interior rooms is important and uh, and then confidentiality confidentiality like uh, just the computer screens and having places to get away and, you know, Joseph, we went through uh, an extensive exercise with you all on the, the glass fronts of the offices because acoustics yeah. were a, a high issue um, and, and we had to make sure we had it right. And there, the, the materials and or the, the manufacturer's products that are out there today have certainly improved over the past 20 years or so. Um, and But it is still something that is of a high concern for, uh, for law firms, but yeah. especially and and that is going to be critical is making sure that you have the right product and that you are following an acoustical engineer's recommendations if you want the the level of sound studio uh, control in your conference rooms. But there are degrees of providing that acoustic. Yeah, we have three three layers of drywall going to deck uh, between each uh, attorney office as well as uh, a pretty robust um, glass wall system. Mm -hmm. All right. Tara uh, asked the question, how are the assistants adapting to working in groups of three with presumably less personal space than previously and without a return or U-shaped desk? Uh, they actually, to be honest, I did not receive any complaints from the, from the secretaries. That was one group that was fine. We initially tried to put uh, paralegals into open workstations. And there was a revolt against that. And uh, we've actually backtracked a little bit on that one, but um, we really did not have any, any issues. You know, again, we were very clear from the beginning about what kind of space they were gonna be in. We actually had a mock-up of the, um, the workstations that all the secretaries were able to go look at. Um, we, we just tried to be very clear about it and emphasize the positives. And I think they're working as a team now. Uh, typically, it's it's a group that's supporting a lot of attorneys versus one secretary supporting one attorney. So, you know, it's, if they're working as a team, I think it's more convenient for them to be together. And I, you know, Troutman was, I think a lot of your success, Joseph, is as you've 
talked about earlier with the cha the change management, with the communications that happened during the process so that people understood the whys and the hows all of this was going to take place. I will say from my own experience, there are times when we have clients uh, whose support legal support group are really resistant to any sort of change, particularly something like this. And there is a desire to stay within an individual workspace um, to create as much privacy as possible. I, I had one experience where, uh, and again, this goes back to generational. Uh, it was a baby or it was a baby boomer, an early baby boomer, who expressed a desire to go back to the offices from where they worked in the 80s. And this was a time when there were actually uh, walls built around secretaries with with almost a transaction transaction window. So there's certainly a generational aspect to this as well in terms of acclimating legal support to more open, more shared collaborative areas, but also providing resource centers that are easily accessible um, on the, uh, to their work area. Uh, and it really creates sort of an ensuite, if you will, for them. And, and they're, they're, they're a group, they're a team. Well, I also think that um, you really, as you're going through the process, you need to emphasize what they're getting out of it. I mean, you need to be clear about this is what's going to happen, but also emphasize you're getting an adjustable height desk. You're going to have access to daylight. You're not going to be uh, stuck wondering what, what the weather's like all day. You'll actually see it. Um, you know, it's going to be a much, uh, much nicer space. Um, and, and I think that's what we really tried to focus on as well as other amenities that we provided. So um, maybe they were losing a little bit of privacy, but I also think that you know, if you're the only person on that whole stretch of uh, workstations, that's also not necessarily the ideal way to, right. to be working. Great response. Uh, we see a question from Christopher. Uh, do you see a shift in more or less computer-aided facility management uh, technology being implemented with the shift towards more modern workplace standards with law firms? I think the so this is this is just my perspective, and I know that there are some uh, some law firms that have implemented great CAFM uh, solutions, but I think that it's a, a little bit of a hard sell at a law firm, especially because the the real estate portfolios tend to be smaller, and the um, the amount of movement and the number of people that are packed together is not necessarily. Um, you're not necessarily moving people around constantly like you are in a corporate environment. So I don't think there's necessarily the same need for such a robust uh, CAFM solution, but I don't know what you're seeing in your clients, but. So I, I, I agree absolutely. It's the size of the firm uh, and, and the size of the office uh, that is gonna have a bearing on whether that's an effective approach to, to management of the facilities. Um, I do know of uh, uh, firms that have um, 500,000 square foot offices where, yes, they use it. Um, and But they also went through the process that Troutman did. They standardized their furniture. Um, they're able to track uh, something as small as a desk chair uh, to know where it is, when it is, and, and, and when it's been moved or when it needs to be moved. Um, but again, I, I think that is going to depend on the size of the firm. I think I think you you need to do a real cost benefit analysis. And when I've looked at um, some of the systems that have been pitched to me, it's hard to make a a case that we're really going to have a huge savings in time or money. I'd like to thank Christopher again for that great question. Uh, Anita asked the question of which stakeholders had a voice in the design, business staff, associates, paralegals? And I will caution before we answer that one, uh, we have about five minutes left until the top of the hour. So anyone who might be late for a, a meeting in the near future, just be warned. But uh, gentlemen, what do you think, uh, or which stakeholders had a voice in the design? Um, was it business staff, associates, paralegals, et cetera? Yeah, uh, well, let me, let me start because we actually, the first thing that we did was actually have a group of uh, of attorneys who were current senior partners, kind of up up and coming partners, as well as some associates. And that was really the first group that um, our chief operating officer and I presented to just about, you know, whether to stay or go, whether we wanted single size offices or, you know, sort of what our 
what our vision was for the attorney space. And the idea was to try to get, you know, people who've been at the firm for a long time, as well as people who are going to be here for a long time and working in this space. Um, we also did, uh, we did get each administrative group to go through a fairly lengthy programming process, as well as the, you know, certain attorney groups, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on, once we brought IA into the process. And, and Joseph, I think what you were describing initially was really before we came on board, when you all were making truly a real estate decision, and, and you know, rightly so, that should be in the senior, senior leadership's uh, hands to do that. But you're right, when we came in, uh, when IA was retained by Trotman Sanders, uh, we came in and worked with them to organize the different groups that uh, should be in, engaged in the programming process and also an opportunity to participate in the visioning sessions. That we and I, I think you guys, you guys actually led that same group of uh, partners and associates yes. through several visioning se sessions as we uh, went through. Great. Uh, Julia asks some great questions, <laughs> starting with, uh, starting with um, do you have any metrics on if Gen Z lawyers accept a job based on workplace design? No, uh, not handy, but it's certainly something that we can, uh, we can start to look into. You know, based on the characteristics and the qualities uh, that, that are being observed right now about Gen Z, it's really, it's more about the workplace culture. It's more about the organization's philosophy and, and values that they're looking for. The opportunity is to let that space message out what that the, their 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 stances, um, what their position is on 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 their firm, their culture, et cetera. And I think that we've had this conversation internally, especially as we we make real estate and uh, build out decisions. And you know, I, I think our our general thought at Troutman is that no no attorney, you know, whatever their their level is, coming to the firm because of the, the design of the workplace, but the design of the workplace could uh, keep them from deciding to join. Right. So it may, be, it may be a detractor, but it's probably not gonna be the, the, the key thing that gets them to come over. So one of my, I'm gonna make this a very quick condensed story. Uh, one of the best things that uh, anyone ever shared with me was a, uh, a woman who was in law school and went to interview for a summer associate position with a law firm whose offices were very, very, very traditional. And the she walked into the reception area and all around her on the walls were very old uh, gentlemen hanging in gold gilt frames. And she knew right away that this was not a place where she was going to prosper, where she would even feel comfortable at times because of the messaging that was being sent out. So this this goes back many, many years, but the same thing, the same idea applies today where when someone walks into the offices, the design really does need to reflect the culture. And and if you're, it, it needs to, to message out to the, the individuals, this is who we're all about. Are we consistent in our, our own philosophies? We've hit the hour mark with that. Um, gentlemen, do you have time in your schedules to continue fielding a couple more questions? Sure. <laughs> All right, we only have a handful more. Uh, Julia asked the question of how much has remote working been incorporated into design? And I'm guessing that's probably specific to law firm design. So we we are seeing uh, discussions around providing uh, visitor offices, particularly with multi-office firms, um, national or global. Uh, there, in, in certain urban areas, uh, there is discussion about uh, providing unassigned uh, workspaces, unassigned offices to allow people to come in. There, even though there's a lot of focus work by attorneys, there is still practice uh, interaction that is required of them. So we haven't started to see like some organizations where if someone works remotely full time, that has that is a far cry. We haven't seen that at all. I would just say that you know, for us, we've just planned. Uh, we've planned to to potentially use that as a strategy in the future, but it's not a driving factor in our design. 
Right. And Diego asked the question, what do you think was a key element of the change management process you went through? I, I think I think being very upfront and honest about everything about the, the new space. So not necessarily telling people, oh, if you complain about this, you can change it, but but just saying, you know, these are the things that are gonna that they're gonna be there, but not trying to emphasize them as, oh, I'm so sorry, but just saying, you know, you're gonna be coming out of an office, but you're also gonna get X, Y, and Z. And uh, I think that was part of it. And then also just making people feel like they were part of the process in terms of choosing uh, choosing their task chair, you know, voting for the task chair they wanted, um, getting to participate in various uh, various fairs related to the space, looking at the new furniture. I, I would say from a process standpoint, I, it was the frequency of communications that Troutman Sanders um, uh, planned within that that process. Uh, letting people know on on a very regular basis what's happening in this process and letting them know when when things would occur and and then reminding them we told you it was going to occur here and it did and this is next. I'm sure it was very boring for them, but there was an HR person at every meeting taking notes for the uh, change management communication. So um, so it was definitely a part of the process. And and but one can only imagine if you hadn't done it, what it yeah. would have been like. <laughs> We're running near the the end of our, our questions. Uh, let's see, we have Greg asked the question of, do you see a difference in law firm design from the major cities to regional centers? And before you answer that, I'd like to point our listeners towards a recent blog post of ours uh, over at IA called Law Firm Design Canada versus the US, obviously slightly different from the question asked by Greg, but uh, an interesting uh, blog piece where we compared to the, the design features seen in, in Canadian versus uh, American uh, versus United States uh, law firms. But um, to get back to the question, uh, do we see a difference in law firm design from the major cities to regional centers? We do. Um, I, I, I would say a big part of that has to do with real estate costs. Uh, certainly in cities like New York and Atlanta and LA, San Francisco, the cost of real estate is much, much higher than it is in second and third tier cities. And so there, there is definitely a focus on efficiency and making certain that you are using every square inch possible uh, in its most effective way. Whereas in the second, third tier cities, you, you're a little bit more liberal. That said, uh, we had an opportunity to work with Troutman Sanders in the Raleigh market on their offices there. And I would say we, we still followed the same dictum that we did for Atlanta and, and focused on effective, efficient space in terms of planning. The, the costs for build out were certainly a lot less. Um, Joseph, I'm sure rent's probably less in Raleigh than it is in Atlanta. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, the, maybe some of the pressures are a little bit less, but I still think that the, the things that we wanted in this office, we still want for our our offices in other cities too, and that includes the flexibility, not having to take on more space that we can than we need, and really being able to build um, to to build on what we've we've got and grow within our space, than to have to continuously take on more real estate. So even even if it's a cheaper space, and sometimes sometimes it's more expensive to to build out in smaller areas because you've got less competition for um, the good contractors, but, right. uh, but, uh, but yeah, but it, the, the, the reason, our reasoning for, as a big firm is still the same. And, and I think too, that there are cultural aspects of this, um, you know, in, in places where that are, that are direct to cost uh, in the second, third, fourth tier cities, you're going to have um, uh, the, the space is a little bit more liberal in terms of uh, availability and people are used to a certain way and they're going to be a little bit more resistant to um, to starting to minimize their their the the rooms or, or areas that uh, they occupy i think if it's a if it's an office that you know that's their main uh their main their main office is in, in a tertiary city um, and they don't have anyone else who's in an, New York or Atlanta or LA, then yeah, it might be harder. I think for us, it's easier to point to our big cities and say, well, we've done this here. Right. We're going to do this uh, where you are too. All right. 
one of our last questions comes from uh, Christina, who asks if we see any gaps on current furniture solutions to accommodate the future. I'm assuming that relates to a more open uh, workplace in the law firm. I am not sure I understand the question. I, well, I think she's 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 asking probably if uh, if the workstation and I you know personally I think you can get furniture to do anything because yeah. currently uh, you know places like WeWork um, you know they're getting furniture to build out these like big empty boxes with just you know different stations around and you could actually even get furniture to build standalone um, offices yeah right. uh, you know I I don't really think furniture is a limitation although um, sometimes I think that the quality of some furniture doesn't uh, the finish yeah, quality doesn't always meet uh, the standards of our firm and that's um, you know maybe just an expectation thing but uh, the durability is important too. So there, there are many options mm -hmm. out there at, at different price points, and the modularity has become uh, really sort of the standard uh, in terms of being able to create custom solutions without paying a custom price. And it, it really is a matter of investigating and then determining what is what is needed for your your specific organization. I think Joseph's image of uh, the partner office from the previous build out to today is certainly um, a, a 180 degree difference um, when you had Baker furniture, traditional furniture items that were pulled together to create an office suite versus applying a, a, tr a true functional furniture system of that's similar quality. And I know we're out of time, but the great thing about this project was that we were able to standardize on an office <laughs> furniture manufacturer uh, you know, we selected Herman Miller and Geiger, but now we have a furniture standard that we're able to apply in multiple places. And even if the office footprint changes a little bit, we're able to to pull this kit apart and use it across our our po portfolio in different um, different ways as we need it. So furniture is great. I think that um, space is always the hard part. Right. <laughs> Great, and uh, that looks like that, that rounds out the questions for today. Uh, we appreciate all the attendees for joining us. We are glad you got a chance to, to join IA. Uh, please be sure to follow IA Interior Architects on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram for updates on future webinars. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you to our presenters. Uh, thank, thank you, you Eric. Thank you, everyone.